Thank you. Thanks a lot. So thanks a lot to the organizers for this very nice conference and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I guess so. It was I, I was basically told that the main aim of this talk should be either to keep you awake or to wake you up. So I'll see what I can do. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, since today is the very last day, I should have written. I mean, the title should have been like Branch and Walks and Martin Boundary. A gentle introduction should be something like that. Um, right, so everything I'll tell you today is based on joint works with uh, Tom Hutchcroft and Daniela Bertacchi and Fabio Zucca. Right, um, okay, so, so let me just, uh, let me start. So um, let me start with the setting. So um, the setting will be a graph. G, that for the moment, let's just say it's going to be infinite, locally finite, and connected. Afterwards, I'll put some more properties on this graph, but I'll tell you later. Um, so we have our graph. And first of all, in order to describe what a branch random walk is, we'll start by defining by setting a transition kernel that I will call P. So basically you can think of it as a matrix so that um, every entry P, X, Y, so X, Y and elements in the graph, vertices of the graph. So P, X, Y just represents the probability that a particle goes from X to Y in one step. Um, for the, um, for the purpose of this talk, since it's supposed to be, I was asked to give an easy talk, so just for the purpose of this talk, I will suppose that um, this, this um, kernel is um, nearest neighbor, so the random walk is nearest neighbor, meaning that PXY is positive if and only if X and Y are neighbors in the graph, meaning that there is an edge connecting them. Okay, moreover, I will need this transition kernel to be transient. So what does transient mean? I will say that the random walk, <coughs> a random walk is transient if um, it will just come finitely many times to the origin, to the starting point, okay? And in particular, this is characterized by um, the following, so uh, let me introduce, okay, so let me say, if we consider the nth uh, convolution power of this um, matrix P, we can, we get entries P, N, X, Y, which for us represent the probability that a particle started at X will be in Y at time N, after N steps, okay? This is what I mean by this. And um, I need this notation because I will define what is called the green function. So for every x and y in the, in the graph, I will denote by gxy the sum over all n larger or equal than zero of p n x y. And since I'm assuming the walk to be transient, this is going to be finite. Um, Right, I will need this notation later, but let me just say we can interpret this function as the expected number of, visit, of visits that a random walk started at x. Um, yeah, the, the expected number of times that a random walk started at x visits y in the whole history. Okay, so let me <coughs> define another quantity that will be very important later, which is called the spectral radius. Um, uh, which I will refer to the spectral radius of the random walk, and it is defined as, so I will denote it by rho of g, and it's just defined as the limb soup over n of the nth root of p n, uh, let's say x x, and by, by these assumptions, by the assumptions that we made, actually this thing, this value, this value actually does not depend on x. So. Um, right, and um, 
later on, so I will make, so now I will make an assumption on this guy here uh, that, will, that I will need later on, which is I need this guy to be strictly smaller than one. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe. I will start playing with these things. <laughs> Right, so um, we, will consider, we will consider random walks governed by P, meaning that they have this uh, transition kernel. Now, to define branch and new walks, we need to say what the branching is. So another ingredient that we'll need is a branching distribution, an offspring distribution. That I will call new. And uh, so basically, the offspring distribution is just a distribution on the non-negative integers. And uh, so that, let's say for every k, larger or equal than 0, I just denote by new k the probability that a particle has exactly k offspring. Um, right, so let me just say what, in a bit of a naive way, what a branch or a new walk is. So you are on your, set your graph. Choose one reference point that probably every now and then I will call it the origin. So fix a reference point and place one particle there. This is your initial configuration. Okay, then what happens? This particle will have a random number of children according to the distribution new. After that, um, all the newborn particles will take one step independently of each other according to the transition kernel P. In the meanwhile, the, the, the mother will die. Uh, so at this point, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just a model, right? <laughs> well, it disappears, goes, goes away, I don't know. <laughs> disappears, disappears. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so at this point, so let, let me just make a picture. Maybe it's the, OK, we start our, part, our process here. Um, this particle will have a lot of offspring. What will happen is that all these newborn people will take one step according to the transition kernel P independently of each other. So you will end up having a few people around here, around, so on and so forth. The mother disappears. Okay. Uh, at this point, you will you at this yeah. This time you have some people at these vertices here. So what do they do? They will um, reproduce each of them independently. They will reproduce having children again with the same distribution new that the mother had. And after that, their newborn particles will move again, taking one step independently of each other, according to the transition kernel p. Again, the old particles will die. So this is how the model works, okay? So at every time you have, at every sort of step, you have reproduction and movement of the particles. Um, okay, so is, is it clear? Okay, great, perfect. Um, right, so this was the first bit of the title. Let's go to the second bit. I, then uh, later on I will come back to this. But um, let's go to the second bit. Um, Martin boundaries. I will not really tell you, ex I mean, all that it's known about Martin boundaries, otherwise I would have to give a 10 hour talk, and uh, it's not possible. Um, so, um, right, later on we will look at some kind of convergence of processes, whatever that means, I'll tell you later. So in order to have some kind of convergence, we would like to have a compact space. The graph that I took was infinite, but it was not necessarily compact. So what we would like to have is some sort of compact space where we can look what the process, our process does. So the thing is, <laughs> there is um, a way to build a compactification, which is known as the Martin compactification. Uh, 
um, starting from this, from the graph and from the transition kernel P. Now, as I said, I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but um, so the thing is, one defines what are called uh, Martin kernels. So this guy is here. So for every x and y, we define the so-called Martin kernel. And it's defined as g, so the green function evaluated at x, y, divided by the value of the green function evaluated at o, y. So o is just the origin, it's the reference point you had. Um, so, as you, so this is a family of functions. It has lots of properties. And in particular, you can build up a Martin, the Martin compactification in such a way that um, essentially these Martin kernels, so if you take sequences of um, sequences, um, so yn is a sequence of vertices in the graph that goes to infinity, whatever that means. So it, what happens is that in the Martin compactification, is, the Martin compactification is built in such a way that this guy here, as n goes to infinity, will tend to um, some uh, continuous function. Will be this guy here will be extended to a continuous function on the on the boundary. Now, uh, as I said, I'm not saying much about this. Um, I just want to say that uh, the Martin compactification, or well. Well, let me just say, um, let me just denote the Martin compactification by g hat. Um, and uh, from now on, we will just say the Martin boundary is this Martin compactification minus the graph itself. So basically, what am I doing here? I mean, I, I haven't really explained what I'm doing. But the point here, what I'm interested in is, it, is this object, which in some particular cases, you can also visualize on a, from a geometrical point of view. So basically, you have all these sequences tending to infinity. So basically, what you do is sort of you identify these guys here with points at infinity. So example, think of a <laughs> think of a uh, infinite binary tree. and it's not an example chosen at random. Um, so if you think about an infinite binary tree, one can show that the Martin boundary, so this object here, this object here, coincides with what is called the end boundary, which is just the boundary at infinity of this thing, which is just, which just consists of the limits of all these rays here, okay? You just look at these rays starting at the origin, and you build them, okay? So it, it, it turns out that in, the, in some cases, for example, in the case of, a, of an infinite tree, the Martin boundary coincides with the geometric boundary, which is really the, the set of points at infinity, really. In general, this is not true. It's a much more complicated object. This is why I don't want to get into details about that. But uh, in some cases, like uh, on, uh, in the case of hyperbolic groups, one can show that this is true. Um, and this is a way to visualize, actually, what, what it is. Um, right, and uh, why is this, why is this uh, interesting? Well, there is a, a classical theorem. I'll try to write it here. There is a classical theorem. which is a sort of convergence theorem that says the following. Suppose you have, suppose that xn is a random walk. Sorry? Oh, uh, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a very good point. So this, this limit here, so this is just a function of sort of x and this, this sequence. So this limit point here depends on x. However, we say, yeah, sorry, uh, we say that yn tends to psi in the Martin topology if for all x this is true. Okay, yeah, 
thank you, thanks. I was not very precise here. Um, also because it's, as I said, this Martin boundary is a, is a bit of a delicate object. So, but thanks, uh, so maybe, I hope this is more clear now. Um, right, so there is a classical theorem, a convergence theorem, that says the following. I mean, it's slightly more uh, general than what I'm about to say, but this is. Okay, so suppose that Xn is a random walk governed by moving, is a moving according to the transition kernel P with those assumptions that I put at the beginning. Um, then what happens is, so, uh, okay, so then what happens is that there is a random variable on, okay, in general, I should say in the Martin compactification, but since we assume transients, that the process is transient, then we can immediately say that the random, walk, the, the random variable that I'm about to talk, uh, uh, that I, I will talk about is in the, in the Martin boundary. So there is a random variable on, that lives on the Martin boundary uh, such that, let's call it uh, x infinity, such that for every x in the graph, the probability that given that the random walk I'm considering starts from x, the probability that x um, n converges to x infinity is equal to 1. So what does that actually mean? Back to this picture, suppose you have a random walk here starting from, from the origin, it doesn't matter where you start. So suppose you have a random walk here governed by p, p will be something, so that uh, it, the random walk is transient. For example, you can consider a simple random walk on the, on the binary tree. So what you have is that um, your random walk will start moving around on your tree, going back and forth and so on. After a while, what will be happening is that it will tend to a random point on the boundary. As I said, this picture here is, I think it's hel is helpful because here the Martin boundary can be seen in a geometric sense. In general, it's more complicated. So um, this is saying there is a random variable that lives on this, in this space. This is just, a, for the moment, this is just a topological space. It's not a measure space. Um, so there is a random variable that is basically representing the limiting point of your random walk. Um, is it, does it make sense? Yeah? What is the dependence on Oh, it just says, uh, so this is just saying the probability that xn tends to this uh, x infinity starting, conditioning on x0 being at x. I mean, starting from x, little x. And this is true for every x under these assumptions. Um, okay. Um, Right, what, yeah, yeah, sorry. Say again. Oh, sorry, this, this is just saying, oh, sorry, I, I should have been more precise here probably. So um, Xn just represent, represents the position of your particle at time n. So this is just saying, x0 is equal to little x, and then x1 will, will be the, um, the position of your particle at time one, so after one step, x2 will be after two steps, and so on and so forth. So here this is saying when time goes to infinity, when you have one random walk governed by, that moves according to this transition kernel p, uh, it will somehow tend to a random variable on this boundary. Is it, is it more clear now? I'm about to say, <laughs> I'm about to say that. Uh, no, 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 this, this, um, this holds in general. I mean, are you saying if, uh, if you need rho of g to be strictly smaller than one? No, you just need transients. 
I, I, just, I just assume this because I'm going to need it later. Yeah. Um, right, so I'm, about, so I'm answering your question now. So basically, as I said, this guy here is a random variable that lives on this topological space. But if you, consi if you consider, so th this, it means that this random variable will induce a measure on this topological space. <coughs> this measure is known as the exit measure of the random walk, or harmonic measure, sometimes you find it in the literature. Um, and uh, basically what, uh, what it is, is the following. I'm just saying, So um, let me just denote, uh, so okay. So this uh, limiting law is such that, limiting law is such that, um, so let me call it uh, gamma, let me call it gamma. Uh, we have that gamma of x of a, where A is a measure, an immeasurable set in the Martin boundary, is a Borel set in the Martin boundary, gamma x of A is just the probability that, starting from x, that x infinity belongs to, uh, is in A. So what am I saying here? So if I just take a chunk of this uh, Martin boundary, say that this is A, it's just the probability that my random walk starting at x, so this is actually depending on x, it does depend on x, uh, will converge somewhere here, okay? This is, uh, and um, what the Martin kernel actually represents, where is it here? It turns out that the Martin kernel actually represents the radon nicotin derivative of the law of x infinity conditional on starting from x, with respect to the law of x infinity conditional on starting at the origin. You just make a, a sort of a change of measure. Okay, so this is what the Martin kernels actually represent. <coughs> uh, okay. Um, right. I wanted to add one thing where I'm going to explain why I need this assumption on the spectral radius. Um, well, let's see. Okay. Um. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, now, I've said something about random walks, so convergence of random walks. Now, what I'm actually interested in is, is this process of branch random walks. So it is known, I mean, it's a classical, sort of classical fact now, um, that we, um, so the, the following is a sort of classical fact now. So what I will need here is first of all that um, the process survives with some positive probability. So in order to assure that, in, to ensure that, I need to um, impose that, so if, I, if M is going to be the sum over, so the, just the expectation of the offspring distribution, I need to ask for m to be larger than 1. So this is one thing. So this ensures that the um, underlying Galton-Watson process survives with positive probability. But I want something more than that, meaning that I need my, uh, my process, the branch random walk, to be transient, meaning that if I just look at the starting point, let's say at the origin, then the origin is visited and most finitely many times by particles of the process. This is what transient means in this uh, context. And in order to ensure that, I need uh, to impose that M is at most one over rho G. And this, this is not absolutely not obvious, and this actually follows by results 
by Benjaminian Perez for the strict inequality and for the critical case. Um, so this is from, I guess, 94 or something like that. And then uh, for the critical case, we need results by Gunther and Müller and also that was proven independently by Bertacchi and Zucca. Um, in let's around 2010 or something, something like that, around this time. Anyway, now I, I hope it should be clear why I need rho to be smaller than one. Otherwise, these two requirements would, be not, would not be compatible. Okay, so I will also need, uh, let me just state it as, a, as an assumption, but there's no, this sort of just, let's say for the experts. We need like a sort of L log L condition, meaning that if L is a random variable distributed according to nu, then we need the expectation of uh, L times log L to be finite. This is just a technical condition that will ensure that something I'm going to say later makes sense. So don't worry about it if you've never heard it. Uh, okay, so what's the point now? What's the idea? We, back here, we have a cl this classical theorem that was telling us, well, we have, we have all this construction of uh, the Martin boundary, we have this random walk, um, and this theorem is telling us, if we have one particle, meaning if we have one random walk, this is, we have some convergence theorem. What we wanted to do was to take this to the next level, sort of. So here I have one particle moving. This is a Markov chain on the graph, meaning this is just a Markov chain on each set of configurations, the, the positions, of the, of, the, of the walk are just the configurations of the Markov chain, the states of the Markov chain. So what happens if we consider a question, if we want to uh, get a result like that, but about branching and walk? Branching and walk is itself a Markov chain on its own state of uh, set of configurations. Now, as I said, for the random walk, it is much, sort of much easier to think about because the, the position of the random walk at time n is the configuration of the Markov chain, the state of, of the Markov chain at time n. In the case of the branch random walk, it's much more complicated because you have lots of particles moving around. So the set of configurations is much, much bigger. Okay? Um, so this was sort of what motivated this, uh, th this question. And um, in order to state the result that I wanted to state, let me just um, introduce an, just quickly a notation, which is the following. So by Bn of x, so x is just a vertex in the graph, n is uh, an integer, Bn of x is, we define it to be the number of individuals alive at x at time n. So number of individuals at x at time n. So if you look at bn as a vector, it is an infinite vector because the entries are indexed by vertices of the graph. So um, however, by our ass assumptions, for every fixed n, it is a finitely supported vector because particles just take one step at a time and they cannot go very far. So Bn is basically telling me the, the configuration of the branch. I mean, this Bn is the branch and walk at time n. It's, the, it's telling me the configuration on the graph of the branch and walk at time n. So all this to say, um, now I can finally state the result. Uh, 
Um, and this is, um, so this is a theorem that we proved together. So it's uh, together with Tom. And there was also a similar result proven independently by Kaimanovic and Verse. Um, that says the following. Um, okay, so suppose again, Xn is a random walk governed by P. By the transition kernel P with those assumptions. And uh, well, let Bn denote the branch random walk um, with underlying transition kernel P and offspring distribution nu, such that you just say uh, B0 is one, so the initial configuration of my branch random walk is just one particle at the origin. Okay, just as I said before. Um, then we have the following thing. Uh, I will just write it and then I'll comment on it. So, first of all, then, almost surely, where here almost surely means for almost all realizations of the branch and walk, almost surely in this sense, almost surely the sequence Bn divided by m to the n, so m was the mean of the offspring distribution, so this thing here, as a sequence in N, converges weakly, and for some people it might be more comfortable to see a star here, but <laughs> anyway, converges weakly to um, some object W, which turns out to be a random measure such that it has the following properties. As I said, I'll just write and then I'll comment on this. The first one is that the support of W uh, is in the Martin boundary. So it's, uh, so remember, this is the Martin boundary that we constructed starting from the transition kernel P. I didn't use anything else. And the second thing, it turns out, let me just, that if we evaluate the expectation of W evaluated in A, where A is some measurable set in the Martin boundary, this is equal to the probability that a random walk, uh, sorry, that a random walk starting from the origin, conver uh, sorry, converges to the, lim the, the, the limiting point of the random walk governed by P is actually in A. So what does that all mean? Let's take a step, step back. First of all, well, are the, is this clear? This <laughs> two things. Okay, then what we have is the following. First of all, we, we have to, okay, so one would like to look at the sequence BN. Problem is, if the process is surviving, is supercritical, it's surviving, then the number of particles you have time n is increasing roughly exponentially, okay? So you don't manage to get to a finite measure on the boundary. So the point is, you have to take uh, a sequence that is somewhat normalized in the right way, and dividing by m to the n, is the, the right way to renormalize it. Why? Because um, the number, so m to the n is just the expected number of people that are alive at time n. So, um, and we know what? We know that if you look at the num, okay, let me just write this, the num, bn, <coughs> sorry, bn, this is just, uh, I mean, cardinality of bn, this is just the sum over all x of b and x. So this is just the number of people alive at time n. And if we consider this value, bn divided by m to the n, this is a martingale, a negative martingale that has lots of nice properties. 
So that object converges almost surely to a non-degenerate random variable. It's conditioned on the vacuum wasp being alive? Say again? It's conditioned on the vacuum wasp being alive? Um, because it dies out after one second. Okay, sure. I mean, if, the, if it dies out, then, well, yeah, I mean, if it dies out, obviously, you don't carry any mass to the boundary. That's the thing. So this is conditioned on? Yeah, you can, you can, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, yeah, otherwise the probability is zero, yeah, yeah exactly. W, w is not, W is not, W is not. Right, no, sorry, sorry, I, I was about to get there, <laughs> sorry. This other one was a probability measure, yes. This one is not, not necessarily, no. So um, that's exactly the thing. So the, this, the, so the idea behind this statement is the following. So if you look at um, Bn divided by m to the n, this is just, if you look at it on what, what it means really, you look, at, you look at your graph and you see lots of particles on your graph at time n and you see those particles, so the mass on each vertex is sort of reduced, right, by this factor m to the n, okay? So you have a mass, really, on the, on the graph. As soon as you change n, this mass is sort of moving. What's happening is that it's moving out because the process is transient, so it's leaving every finite set of vertices. So the mass is moving out. It means it goes, has to go somewhere, and it goes towards the boundary, meaning this uh, boundary meaning this, this guy here. And uh, the reason why, so it, it will give a random, uh, sorry, it will give a measure on the boundary. The reason why this is, bound, uh, this is um, random, so one way to see this is that for every, so the, the total mass on, that you carry to the boundary is the limiting random variable that you obtain from here. So, as I said, this is a martingale, non-negative martingale, so it converges almost surely to some, to some um, uh, random variable w. And by this condition that we had, the, we know, for example, that the expectation of this random variable is one, but this is a random variable. So the mass, the total mass that you carry to the boundary is random. So if you look at every measurable set on the boundary, W, so this measurable set on the boundary A, W of A is a random variable because it really depends on the realization of your, of your branch and walk. So this is why you, look, you, you go and look at, your ex, at the expectation. So this is, we can't really say much about this measure, but if, what we know is that if we look at the expectation of this random variable, then th this gives exactly uh, the probable, oh, where, where was it? Oh, yeah. That guy over there with x equal to the origin because we, we set it to start, we set the, the branch and the walk to start at the origin. Yeah. So uh, it's not clear. It's not clear. Um, w let's say we're working on it, but it's not clear at all. In some, Okay, we, we have some conjectures, but um, maybe we can talk uh, later on about this. Uh, we have some conjectures about when it might be true and when it might not be. Um, in, what was the question? If, uh, I, I guess the question <coughs> was that uh, whether this guy here is somewhat um, a multiple of the, of the exit measure, is that? Yeah. So. Um, we have some conjectures about it, but uh, maybe we can talk later. Um, right, so I'm not really, okay, <laughs> I just looked at the time. Uh, I don't want to go into details with this, so I don't, I'm not giving you the proof or anything. Um, although it's, it's interesting, but uh, I didn't want to, I don't want to go, uh, I don't want to talk for, for too much time. Um, so this is one thing I wanted to say. Uh, another thing I wanted to, to mention is the following. So now I, 
I was speaking about what happens on the graph itself. Next question is, what happens if I have my branch random walk defined on the graph, but I want only want to look at what happens on subgraphs? Okay, so you give me some subgraph, I want to understand what happens in there. Sorry? You had the bound that you deleted on m, m less than 1 over rho? Uh, yeah, because we needed transients. Uh, and uh, if we don't have this, uh, do you think the theorem fails? Um, well, no, it's not really failing, but uh, okay, if you don't have transients, then sort of this is failing because the mass does not accumulate on the boundary. It will be mass everywhere all the time. So it will be on the whole. Co um, no, I mean, you would have mass accumulating everywhere. I mean, okay, okay, okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, the thing is, in order to ensure this, we, we, we need the transients. But uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss later. If, uh, So, um, right, so if we go to subgraphs, let u be a subgraph of G, um, then, sorry, I will have to introduce a little bit more notation. Um, here, what we do is we sort of define other transition kernels on U. So, P of U is essentially defined as follows. So, um, for every x and y in G, we set PU of xy to be equal to uh, P of xy if both x and y are in U and zero otherwise. So this is, a this is our substochastic matrix if you look at it. So this is saying so what, what we can imagine out of this is uh, if I have a random walk that moves according to this kernel, then it will move around as long as it is in U, in the subgraph U, but as soon as it exits, I kill it. Okay? And uh, another transition kernel that we, we define is Q of U, that is so that for every X and Y in U, we set Q U of X, Y, to be, um, okay, maybe I'll just write it this way, uh, PU of XY, if um, the sum over W in U uh, of PXW is equal to one, meaning that if the random walk cannot go outside from X, then I just say Q of U of XY is just the same as I had, sorry, I had here. And uh, otherwise, I define it as, I sort of renormalized in some way, and I define it to be P U of X Y divided by the sum over W in U of P X W. So how do we think about this transition kernel? This is just, um, it's sort of, it's the transition kernel governing a random walk on U conditioned on staying inside you. So every time it, try, it goes to a vertex where it could go outside, I make it bounce back. This is what I'm doing. Okay, and um, obviously from when you have a transition kernel, then you can define their respective um, spectral radii. So for, rho, uh, for P of U, we find the, well, we, define, we denote the, the spectral radius by rho of U. And for Q of U, we denote the spectral radius by um, phi of U. And by the way these things are defined, we always have the rho of U is smaller or equal than rho of G. Rho of G was the spectral radius of P. And uh, also rho of U is smaller or equal than phi of U. Because the entries are at least given by those of P. Uh, okay. And... Uh, in the very last part of my talk, 
I would like to say a few things so, um, regarding this. So what we are interested in, in this kind of uh, setting, is, um, are for example, when a random walk survives inside the subgraph U, or when it, we say, when it persists, for example. By surviving, we mean the following thing. Let me just maybe write it here. So we say that branch random walk survives in the subgraph U if, let's say, U is visited infinitely many times by the process. By the process. Whereas we say that the branch in the walk persists in U, um, roughly said, uh, we said it persists in U if uh, um, the branch in the walk started at some vertex in U, will have trajectories that never exit U in their whole history, in their whole life if there are trajectories that never exit U. So this is what we say by persist. So the big difference between these two guys here is that in the first case, particles can go out of U and then come back to U and infinitely often, and that's fine. We say that this is still surviving. But um, if a particle goes, out, if a trajectory goes outside, and then comes back to you, then, I mean, it, we don't count it anymore because as soon as, in the second case, as soon as we go, out, as soon as the trajectory goes outside, it's like we kill it. Okay. Um, right. Um, so we have, okay, so in this setting, let's say, let me just state the, the first theorem. I don't think I will have time to state more. Um, this is, uh, one thing that we proved with uh, uh, Daniela and Fabio. Um, let me not go into details, but let me say if, um, if U is regular enough, um, for this talk, let, let's just think that U is transitive. Just for this talk, it's, it holds more in general, but so that we have, uh, we know what this is saying. Um, right, then we get a sort of analog on the subgraph of that theorem over there, meaning that if we look at Bn, that is the branch end walk defined on the whole graph, <coughs> divided by m times rho of u divided by phi of u, phi of u to the n. This, again, almost surely, meaning for almost all realizations of the branch and new walk, converges weakly. Now, to a random measure, this thing here depends on u. Now, this guy here does not live on the, so the support of this guy, of this, uh, random measure, this new random measure here, is not the Martin boundary defined by P anymore, but the support, uh, such that, the support of uh, W, uh, U, uh, is in the Martin boundary that we can define starting from QU. Let me just say here. And also, again, we have a similar thing to the, to the second statement over there, meaning that for all uh, measurable set in, um, in the Martin boundary of Q of U, uh, this is, um, okay, again, we have that the expectation of um, W, U, of A, starting from some vertex A inside uh, the, the subgraph U. This is just the probability that a random walk, <coughs> we call it X again, 
the random walk converges to A, but when, when it moves according to the transition kernel Q. Um, let me just say without, I mean, writing anything. Um, that, so basically what, okay, let me just comment on this. So basically this is saying under some assumptions, the right normalization value for the branch random walk is actually m, uh, okay, over there on the graph was m to the n, but here is m times this value. And well, if you want later on, we can discuss how this value comes from, uh, where this value come from, comes from. And uh, I think it's, it's a nice, it's, um, it's a nice result because sometimes what happens is that you have, this w will give you as a consequence that I didn't manage to discuss, but this will give you that there are cases, there are examples where the random walk itself um, has zero probability to converge to some measurable set of in the Martin boundary. So it has zero probability, but the branch random walk will have trajectories converging there, nevertheless. Because the thing is, the, 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 what is really happening here is that the branch random walk has so many particles that many of them will behave really in a, a typical way and many of them will do something they do not really want to do. So um, I see that my time is essentially up, so I will stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>